cycling podcast for one of the better classics we've had this season, particularly yeah. in the men's race. Brabant Pale uh, 2024, starting in Lerva and finishing in Overreza, 195 kilometers long. It's a semi classic. Yes, it's dot pro, but really, this is like there's some. It's like Kerner Brussel Kerner. It's dot pro, but it's world tour level race, in my opinion. Uh, even though Ineos and Visma are skipping it this year for some reason. Uh, it's a hilly course, not quite as long as the Amstel Gold Race course, but they do laps of like six, 500-meter 7% climbs or 1K 5% climbs, but the Mosca Strat features heavily, which is a little bit more difficult, probably the, the hardest one in the race, 500 meters yeah. at 8 9%. Also, it's cobbled. They finish up the Esbocht, which is a 3% nasty false flat drag into the town of Overreza. Uh, and yeah, it's a good race, Benji. Who was who was the favorite? Bling, I think, was actually the bookie's favorite. Was he really? Oh, yeah. Actually, I like I think so. In the past, I think we've seen Kokar win in this race all back in the day. But looking at this parkour and the way it was raised last year, Godon winning last year, and going into the, this year, I felt like the key was in the hands of the Cafflonage there. I was also looking at Dylan Turns because he was really strong at RVV, for example. Wellens is here, was very strong in the Cobble Classics as well. And were there other riders that you had an eye on before this race going into this? Uh, I just thought it was generally a strong like start list overall. Yeah. I, I wanted to see how uh, Albanese went, but he didn't have a good race. I wanted to see how even someone like Segart got around the hilly course. Uh, or, you know, Tobias Hallen Johansson's here. He's, I, I think he's been injured or sick. Uh, but he, yeah, he really should be like a favorite for this race. He's really punchy. He's one, he's a winner of races. But uh, I was just, I wanted to see, I was excited against Benji because there just weren't mm -hmm. the big guns here. Yeah. And, and yeah. that meant we're not going to get it. You're not going to get a 60K solo because they're not here. Yeah, but also it's the kind of vibe of like, if there's one of the big X amount of riders, then it's going to be a long solo. If there's multiple of them, then we might get an actual clash. If there's zero of them, we've got a clash with the people that are not part of the big X amount of riders. And I'd say there's about, ooh, maybe this is controversial, but I think there's about big three at the moment. Jonas Vingago, Pogacar, and Van der Poel. And uh, who else? Well, Remco Roglic and Wout van Aert are the other three, but this year I'd say they're not in that top category yet. Remco is. So no. far this year, I can't call that. Remco's, Remco's so good. Um, <laughs> but who knows? Maybe he would have been... Yeah, I mean, he's still got... True, uh, if you want to be in that tier, that tier is like if they finish the race, they win it, right? That's the yeah. tier you're talking about. Remco finished the race and Jorg beat him in Paris. So I sort of... I take what you mean. i obviously a, a Remco believer. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> they're not here. Uh, sort of thank God for once because <laughs> he was a really, really interesting race. Uh, Alperson maybe had the deepest or most aggressive team with Cern Kra, mm -hmm. Laurence, and Van Tricht and Quinton Hermans. But we had a breakaway, Benji. Who, who was in this, this breakaway? I must confess I wasn't tuned in at this point. So Anders Halland Johansson, family of uh, Tobias, Lorenzo Manzin, Thomas Kopecki for, uh, for TD2 Unibet, James Whelan for Q36.5, Jens Reinders. I swear, back in the day, there was some rumor in some off-season that he would be joining UAE, and then he didn't, and he joined Bingo instead or something. I don't know. Nicolas de Beaumarchais exists as well in this breakaway for Cofidis, Alan Ryu for uh, Arkea, and Jordi Warlop for uh, Sudal Quickstep. Now, looking at this breakaway, it's got okay riders, but it's also a breakaway that is being controlled actively by, at first, the Caflonage de Zaire, They've got, I think, Rasmus Peterson at the front of the peloton. Eventually, Alpsen starts helping and taking over the pacing in full uh, when the hill zone starts getting inside. And when that is happening, Dusan Rajovic makes a bit of a move, right? I didn't see it, but you saw it. Yeah, on one of these time actor descents, it's 70 k's to go. It's not that much on. Yeah, they're fine for a corner, but like, it's still 70 k's to go. Let's be real. And uh, yeah, he does. He hops up onto the curb, and it is a step change. It's not like well, there is a step level change, yeah. so it's not part of the course. Hops up, moves up position. Also, like he's already kind of at the front. Like I don't know why. And then he uh, he tries to swing back in, oversteers, or bump someone, and then almost oversteers back, and nearly loses control of his bike, and then has to hop back up on the curb. Then there's a sign coming, 
That's the duck under the sign. That's off the course, by the way. He's still on. He's back on the level change, and then goes back onto the peloton. And it's just, it's the Masuk incident was the same yeah. thing. Worse because he's literally in the grass, and so he had less control. But um, we we have to call out safety incidents, and there's the examples of. Uh, where riders at Vanderpool said, you know, we're, we're armchair analysts, but it's uh, Vanderpool, Bill Bow, these they are also saying it's the riders often making the danger. Yeah. It's not just when there's a big pileup. They need to, there needs to be sanctions when there's not a big pileup. And this is, this could have been mass in RVV 2.0. Exactly. And it's also on one end, it is the behavior of the riders, but it's also highlighted by the fact that the UCI doesn't consistently, consistently suspend or penalize on these moves because I vividly remember that last year when we were talking about Machayuk a few days earlier was it Brugge de Pane or Kent Wevelhem Wibbes goes off the goes off the road into also kind of a, a driveway basically and goes back on the road crashed an entire group that way in the same way as Machayuk did so we're looking at the same scenario nothing happened in that race when it comes to penalization while Machayuk is off out for multiple months suspension by the UCI so it's inconsistently Penalized to the point that it incentivizes riders to keep doing it because they might get away with it. Arrivage in particular, we've made jokes about it before, but if we're joking about you being dangerous, there's also the reality is like, yeah, seeing you do so much shit, him so much shit the last two years, it's like, it's ridiculous. And today could have gone, could have gone worse. But uh, anyway, we move on. Uh, our quick, not quick step, Jesus. I call them quick step because they are the new quick step. Albers and De Koenig. <laughs> <laughs> they're in my mind they're like the dominant classics team now uh breakaway gets caught and alperson start jumping certain Kra, yeah. quentin hermans they're trying to get into moves trying to split the race and that makes sense because they probably have the deepest three leaders in the race in that laurence Kra, anderson and hermans all could win this race and so they want to basically get two of them or three of them in a group of 10 or so and they eventually do get that benji uh, with around 45 k's to go. Yeah, and I feel like throughout this like phase from 70 to 45 kilometers to go, it's not just Alperson, but it's absolute chaos with counterattacks and attacks and attacks everywhere. Once that breakaway got caught, even just before that, we just had attacks everywhere. And the two sides of the story were the attackers, including Alperson, and on the other side, EF trying to keep everything together for Marin van den Berg. That, that was the two sides of the storyline for me. And at this point, the attacks were kind of winning is how I felt. And then I think the Moscow started 50k to go, what was the first one where, where a group started being created. I think it was Morgado that let out Wellens on the Moscow start, pure mustache style to the top, 15 man group over the top, bit of a split in there, but eventually it, it comes, well, you, you've got some group that, that is ahead, but the others then get closer. And I don't know, it's like, it's like nothing truly gets away until that move that you just pointed at, which is at 45 kilometers to go. Laurent's bridging towards uh, uh, some leftovers of moves from earlier. And we've got a move that includes Laurent's, De Porter, Ubi, Antoine Ubi from Sudal Quickstep, Frank van den Broek of DSM, Lawson Craddock, who seemed to be on, on the wheels more than he was actually contributing because he has matches behind, Morgado in there, Alex Segar from Lotto, but he seemed to be suffering there, Andreas Leknesson in there, and eventually Dude. we see the bridging of Kra Dude. Andersen and Kosnerfra, but go ahead. I had a dream, maybe a nightmare. <laughs> this is so strange, but I was going to do an analysis of this. And it was last night, and I, only, I forgot until you, I saw him in, in the notes, Leknesson. Yeah. I had a dream that I was doing Pilates or yoga or something, and that Leknesson for some reason, then put like his tail down next to me and then was like, then it's just like, like bashing me. Like when he was doing Pilates. <laughs> Lechnison too. No random like so, it was Lechnison. Why? Um, How? It make, I haven't thought about the guy since the Giro last year. It makes no <laughs> sense. Like, what is going on? <laughs> I, have, I have no animosity to him. I've never interacted with the man. <laughs> but seriously, that happened. I, I only remember now because he's in the notes. I would have forgotten forever, but um, and <laughs> I don't know how we then we like started scrapping. I uh, started, started started fighting. So I don't. Yeah, very very strange stuff. Um, but maybe yeah, maybe that spurred him on to get in the break today. Anyway, um, that group is ahead. They go seriously, towards the. I'm not making it up. 
I just can't. I can't. I can't. Sorry. But what the fuck is that story? <laughs> okay. That was the dream section of today's podcast. On to the actual factual race situation. 40 Ks to go. Esbocht Alvarez is here. That group is still ahead, but the riders are kind of suffering in there. Some of them at least. Some are looking good still. 14 seconds roughly is the gap. He ever still pacing in the peloton, but we see a bridge from the peloton to the front. I think it's Steven Williams that honestly easily bridges to the front. He needs one Esbocht straight at the front. Then I feel like we saw that a lot today. And I feel like some teams were kind of getting played with as in, uh, for example, 35k to go. Lotto is hard pacing in the peloton on the climb itself for Krohn to try and do something after the climb. But reality is he, he, he is ahead at the top, like a few meters. But then he can't, because he did the effort on the climb itself, he can't make the bridge towards the front then. Yeah. And then he starts riding with the group to try and get to the front, but everybody else starts, starts just going from that group and bridging towards the front in one go, because they didn't do those efforts on the climbs at the front. So it, it's as if bridging works way better than trying to help the group get closer for everybody, for every individual person here. And we saw I that feel later like, too with Bling. Yeah. That's true. Bling got played in the same in the same fashion, and I feel like it all came around and it all came together towards the Mosca Strad again, because the Mosca Strad is really that hard hitter you mention every single time. And we're looking at thirty kilometers to go at that Mosca Strad, and you're always lining it up. You're always lining it up. Peloton. That's the that's the situation at the moment. It's just a peloton with with you lining it, lining it up. It's I think pull it pacing for Wellens, and turns us in the wheel, and. Turns launches past well and past ball, it's straight ahead. And there's only two riders that can follow on this Mosca Strat. It's Tem Wellens and it's Marijn van den Bergen. Is it me or did I not expect Marijn van den Bergen to follow us? Yes, he's been fucking good the last few races in sprints and reduced sprints, but getting with these two riders over the Mosca Strat after such a brutal move by Turns, who was who was putting Wellens in trouble on this climb, was that for me that was shocking, no? That he was there? Yeah, a little bit surprising. Uh, I'm trying to look. Like, uh, he won some French races, like a hilly race ahead of Benoit and Venturini uh, in uh, last week, Région Petit La Loire. I got to say, I didn't watch it. Uh, he won in Catalonia, of course, but that really was the, the easy sprint day. But he's definitely in better shape this year, and he's, he's actually one of EF's winners. Like, he's won four races this year, won three races last year. And uh, he's 24, out of contract, Dutch. So he's certainly putting... Yep. Today, he was certainly a, a big a big statement that he's not just like a, a Catalonia-reduced sort of misc sprinter or yep. a Romandy sprinter. He can race in a, in a, in a one day and follow on uphill. So he... Uh, did he do that, Clay? He didn't do... He did the Tour of Flanders, came 54th. In, in hindsight, Benji, he, I, I don't remember Mate. EF... Apart from Betty all doing anything in the other races, Krunen and Wevelgem, yeah. Omlop, like Omlop, uh, you know, who came, Mayus came top 10 or something, like it all came back together. So, in hindsight, 2020, of course, but uh, he should have been in their classics yeah. team if this is his shape. But maybe at Amstel, he'll do even better. I think that Amstel is actually a bit harder, though. Uh, anyway, we'll kind of cut to it's the status quo now. Uh, Hubi tries Wait. to change his bike. Oh, yes. We got to talk about that, the bike change of Hubi, because he's behind the peloton group with about 30k to go. We go into this corner, a 90 degree left hand corner. Peloton goes in there and he jumps off the bike. He takes a bike that's already stationary by the side and just keeps going. First thought in my head was, uh, well, that was a very quick, very crazy bike change because that wasn't like snap and he was on a new bike. My second thought was Luke talking to me telepathically and saying that's not allowed that should be disqualified because isn't that what Ghana did in Provence or Bessèges yeah, two years Provence, ago Provence before <laughs> Montagne de Lua even might have been before the, the mountaintop finish he changed from the aero bike actually no he must have had a flat because then he lost the Pinarello's one bike no they never had an aero bike and a climbing bike why did Ghana change Luke will know uh he says he changed the rim brakes <laughs> but, holy <laughs> shit <laughs> Is that, that real is... or are you joking, Luke? No, no, he's changed the rim brakes. <laughs> Otherwise, why else would you change? Yeah. They, they, don't, have a t they don't have a, an R5 and an S5 like Savella. Yeah. So... <laughs> anyway, that is funny. Flashback. <laughs> hey, rim brakes, save them. 
Uh, but Paul Antoine Ubi gets disqualified. Uh, you know, well, do I care? Did he? Do I... He should have. Nice. Well, I, I meant talk about disqualified in and out. So <laughs> oh, I, didn't, I, I didn't mean he, did. he got disqualified. He probably should have been, but I don't care. I actually <laughs> don't care about that rule. I really think it's okay. <laughs> I don't really mind. Like, if it's safe to do so, I don't see the problem with it. It's safer than a mechanic leaning out the car trying to fix your derailleur yeah, on the which flight. Which is also not allowed. He also not allowed, but we saw people <laughs> still see it occasionally, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, because Israel are not in the group of Vandenberg, Turns, and uh, Velens, they, they're chasing. Uh, as no, Israel is turns, not Israel. Alperson, <laughs> because Alperson are not in the group of three, they missed out. They're chasing. Sir and Krah doing massive pulls. There's Hermans not pulling, so they don't pull with Hermans. Hermans is their real protected rider. Jaco Bling is pulling, and I don't know if it was Blackmore or I need to check if it was someone else for Israel. Blackmore really looks like Schultz. I think it was Blackmore who was messing up the chase. And Blackmore was just sitting there. So he's yep. being so annoying. And you're always rolling through, stopping, stopping. Eventually, Decathlon, before uh, an important climb, Decathlon just lined it out for Benoit with uh, coming up to 11 case uh, to go. Uh, they'd already done the Mosque strut, by the way. And, and MVDP actually looked really, really strong. He had turns and wellens on a gap. Uh, Herman's. <laughs> Hermans. MVDB, right? Von der Berg, yeah? Yeah, same guy. <laughs> he looked like MVDB today. <laughs> Herman's used the Moscow Strat, the last one, to, to bridge across that group. And now it's panic stations for like bling because the team that was just chasing is now represented ahead. And then Decathlon realized that too on the Holtz data. They basically launch Kosnifra and he gets across there quick smart. He or she's disrupting group two. But now for Israel... And EF and the other teams, they're like, oh, well, we don't really have a big advantage now. No one has multiple numbers in the group ahead. Vandenberg's probably the quickest sprinter or Benoit. So Wellens and Turns are not just pulling super hard, so it's still bridgeable. And we see Cepeda flying across, as well as Joseph Blackmore going across to that move, who's the only rider from a, a team that was already represented. So the final group, Wellens. Turns, Blackmore, two teammates, Cepeda on Kaha, Kosnifra, who's probably got the best sprint, Hermans, and Moran van den Berg, and no, but no Bling. So Bling misses it yeah. after pacing. And now with that group, NG, what did you, I didn't think that group would get caught, but I also didn't know exactly how they'd play it. Yeah, I mean, either, because on paper, Marijn van den Berg is the fastest on a flat sprint. Is that the same once you have to sprint up the Isbok in Overdijs? I don't know if that's going to be the same. He's been pretty good on uphill sprints every now and then as well, so that exists. Turns of pure sprint is not great, so will Israel start rolling attacks on the group with Black Moran and Turns? Is that a possibility? Cepeda just bridged. I don't know what a sprint is like. I have no clue what he's going to do. So that exists. Kosnifra, pretty fucking fast. He can afford to wait for the final sprint. Uh, I'm looking at this group and there's so many potential scenarios, but the one scenario I didn't expect happens. Uh, just bring us back to two years ago once there was a group ahead with Sheffield involved. Sheffield goes to the front and nobody takes his wheel and he rides off into the distance. And today exactly the same happens. We see Marijn van der Berg going to the front of the group. Cepeda does not take his wheel, but goes off the front, skipping the turn for some reason. And Van der Berg rides off into the distance for a bit. And then I was thinking, okay, there's still Blackmore, there's still turns. Who's the best rider on this finish, do you think, without knowing their history? Well, without with knowing, knowing their history. Blackmore. Without knowing, you can't do anything. Okay. Blackmore or Benoit? You, not including Vandenberg, because he's up the road? Well, Van den, yeah, it'd be Blackmore, Vandenberg, and uh, Benoit. But just a note on who Blackmore is, because, like, yeah, Dylan Turns, he's like, to Dylan Turns, Blackmore is an Australian supplement, health supplement company. <laughs> yeah. Like, he don't know who he is. They've never met each other. And then, oh, well, I don't know that, but he's on the Conti team, this guy. He's a 21-year-old Brit. And, like, after the race, I think one of the riders was like, yeah, Stevie Williams was real good in that group. It was Stevie Williams. It was Joseph Blackmore. <laughs> And this guy, right? So I got to give credit to Athers in the LR Discord. He's, he's been on this guy for saying how good he is for a year. Apparently, like his first ever road race was Tour de Rwanda in 23. Uh, a bit of like a late starter for U23s. He came sixth, including second on the Kigali stage. No team, by the way. He was on 
run for the British team there. Then all all Orleans Nation Grand Prix, another U23 race, EE top 10, straight away, second road race. And then Lavenir, 12th, including like decent yeah. enough results in some of the mountain stages, but not a pure climber, more of a puncher. And uh, still no World Tour contract, fair enough, but Israel gave him a con- uh, and credit to Israel, they gave him a one-year U23 contract on the, oh, not U23, on the, on the development team. He went to Rwanda this year, one, uh, and that's ahead of like uh, Le Cerf, who, by the way, Le Cerf uphill is very good this year. Yep. One Taiwan, uh, ahead of like professional riders like Gate and Co. And then eighth in the Volta NXT Classic, which is like a serious race. That's where Kielik won, and he was good in, uh, in, in Roubaix. And yep. the Circuit des Ardennes, he beat Timon Hart. And uh, in one of the sprints, he, he beat fucking Paul Manier. He beat Paul Manier in, in a sprint last week or three yep. days ago. Three days ago, he beat him. So, but does Dylan Turns know that? Dylan, Paul Manier, by the way, is the kid that on quick step just absolutely obliterated everybody on an uphill kick in, in Oman. He's, apparently, he's like beating Merlier in town sign sprints. So he beat him in a sprint on, on uh, Sunday. But does the Israel car know that, Benji, or turns? Uh, I don't know, because we see Blackmore pacing for turns. And with the results I've seen from Blackmore this year, I would have, I would have forget, had him do the sprint because I don't trust turns in the sprint versus Kosnefoa. So either you roll attacks with both or if you go for the sprint for black for more for me, which is, it's against the logical hierarchy. Turns is going into the Ardennes Classic as their all-out leader. So I think the team is just so around turns that they, people management-wise, didn't make that decision. While I think Blackmore should have been a decision here. I'm not going to say, oh, you got to go for Blackmore on the sprint. Because in reality, like, it is still a 200k dot pro race against serious guys. He might be fucked. It's not doing some U23 sprint against, against the U23s. So I'm not going to say, ah, oh, you, you're idiots for not going for, for Black yeah. Moon sprint. But, but, against Benoit and against Vandenberg, what's the probability turns wins the sprint head-to-head with just a normal lead out? It's not that Limited. good. Cosner Fry is a nasty sprinter in these groups, uphill. Like, yep. really nasty. He won in uh, Albemarle team. He's won, he, he's really, really strong. So in that sense, with, you're the only team with numbers, Benji. You have to play Blackmore or turns. And they sort of half did it. They like, without fully committing to it, they like let the wheel go, like you close it. And that created the situation where Vandenberg went up the road. And now you have the opposite of what you want. Instead of Blackmore being up the road, you have, or turns, you have Blackmore being forced because you're the only team with two riders to chase Vandenberg. And yep. now it's basically, you just, Everyone's getting the equivalent benefit as well as turns. And he does that. He does that so strongly. He brings back Vandenberg, who I thought was gone for good. If Blackmore wasn't yep. so good, then Vandenberg wins. Does the lead out. Uh, and then turns jumps. Good timing from turns. He did time it really well. Um, up the barriers very nicely. But Benoit's in his wheel. Turns opens up the gap. It doesn't matter if he did or not. And Benoit comes out like a rocket and just obliterates everybody in the sprint. Turns coming second. Velen's third. Blackmore comes fourth despite pulling ahead of Cepeda and Hermans, who were in his wheel for the last K and a half. Vandenberg got caught, loses 10 seconds. Yeah, it's, it's as simple as that, to be honest. I, I look at Vandenberg being caught and I see he probably thinks he made a mistake right now. But yeah. if Vandenberg finished and said in his interview, okay, uh, I, might, I maybe made a mistake by, by continuing that action, but it's also not that he attacked and full-on decided to attack the group. He was a stronger sprinter on paper in the group, so he just went with the, with the gap he was given. And I won't tactically roast him over that. Yes, on paper, his sprint would have been a better option, but the situation was kind of given to him, so he went with it. He gets caught, and, and we get that sprint like you mentioned. And Kosnefort eventually out sprinting turns. Not shocking to me, Kosnefort winning from this group in a sprint. Not shocking to me. Hedmonds just falling to the group. I didn't expect it, but it was just empty. Quinton Hedmonds here. So he just didn't have it anymore. And I don't know, like, this was a really good race, by the way. Like, this was, this was better it's than RVV and Roubaix combined. Yeah, the last 30Ks or 20Ks, you want to watch this? Really exciting race. I, it's always a good race. I really like this race. Um, it's a shame Ineos and Visma didn't do it, to be honest. But yeah. maybe it's a good thing because then... Maybe they would have people- ruined it. Yeah, other people get to shine. Um, but what was I going to say? On, on the Vandenberg thing, it's like, yeah. 
if someone gives you 100 meters for free and group two mm -hmm. syndrome can come out can take over and there's an israel conti rider in the team and you got to ride against him in the group behind i you know I, he he well could have won benji he yeah well exactly. easily could have won but now he's looking at it like yeah if he stays in the group he podiums for sure yeah. like in the sprint he he probably comes second at worst so yeah. now he's like yeah it was a mistake he shouldn't blame himself over it that's no. how i see it and and then the situation we also have is turns is second blackmore is fourth but did you already mention that his points don't count for ipt in this podcast they don't count because if you if you're on the conti team even though you race up uh, they don't count to the to the relevant world tour teams so he now has uh 500 just about uci points and we're not in, we're in halfway through april he could be a thousand point scorer yeah. and it, as well because they're a pro team if he was in the pro team he can still race up and down in the pro and, and the related conti team if he was in the pro team but they can't uh, luke and you say he can't be moved up because they're at the full complement of riders yep they are at the full complement of riders 30 riders in the past there were there were rules that allowed uh, you to go up to 32 uh, in some sort of structure uh, during COVID, because then we were talking about, okay, these riders are out of contract, let's get them in a team during COVID, during the more difficult time, and right now it's 30 uh, riders again in the stagiaire period, that's going to be different, you can have more than 30 then, which, whatever points he's scoring now, will be completely irrelevant if they find a way to fire someone from the, from the World Tour team. <laughs> And have Blackmore join. Obviously, you can't just ditch a rider to, to your dev team without like a proper reason for it. So I don't see that happening. So I think he's stuck in in their dev team for the year. So I think his points are uh are not gonna count for uh Israel Premier Tech at this race. So that yeah, that's a bummer. And at all the other races as well this year. And by the way, I need to well, mention no, they don't count even if they moved him up tomorrow, the the points today yep. don't count. Exactly. I need to mention yesterday or in our previous podcast. You were talking about the the famous leader of Bahrain, Burati, Nicolo Burati. You unironically just predicted his best race of the season. He got 18th. <laughs> See, I knew that. <laughs> Who is he again? <laughs> He's the guy that you thought was Misato. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> he done nothing all year. <laughs> No, nah, actually, that's not true. I, knew, I, I for some reason I remember he was okay in like Crow Race or something because I, I always cover that race. But okay, good on him. Twenty-two. All right. Um, and which is the one on Busato? Is Busato twenty-eighth. Busato. Okay, so he beat the Intermarche guy who came fourth in the Volta NXT, the Volta Limburg. Yeah. Uh, okay. Fair enough. Uh, I, I should probably go through the top 10. Yeah, Cosnifra wins ahead of Turns, Wellens, Blackmore, fourth, Cepeda. Still a nice result for Kaha, fifth in a dot pro one, one day race. Uh, Herman, sixth, Vandenberg, seventh. Matthews won the sprint behind. Eighth, Vito Breit, ninth, Corbin Strong, tenth. So three Israel riders in the top 10. Uh, and that was a pretty large group. And yeah, as you said, Benji, they can't, unless they move a rider off. The team Israel, they can't put uh, Blackmore on there. Um, and he also can't do World Tour races. And uh, so like he he could win a Giro stage. Yeah. Or a, like, he, but he can't be Derek he, Derek G. But I don't, uh, Luke will correct me if I'm wrong, but he can't do World Tour races with the, with the team. So he can't do Amstel can. this weekend. Uh, I don't know how it works. If, if they're a World Tour team, he definitely couldn't. I don't know how it works with the pro team, but I think he... He can't do them. He can't do world tour races as a Conti rider. So, uh, yeah, they might want to sort that out. Uh, and and listen, <laughs> some some team got to get that guy. Um, Question as well. What does today learn you for the upcoming classics? Because I feel like my thoughts towards Amstel don't necessarily change. Turns was as strong as I expected. I'm expecting him to be very strong at Flesh Wallon. Was this the year where they put another Murder Hui in Flesh Wallon, or was it a women's race? Ooh, I can't remember. I don't know. That's I can't remember say. either. Because I'm looking at the star list and obviously we've got Dylan Turns there, but I'm looking at other teams and I'm like, okay. I kind of feel that like this is a, a, a Dylan Turns special coming on next Wednesday. Because he looks so fucking strong right now. And Poggy's not doing it. Remco's not doing it. Roglic's not doing it. Maybe. Probably not. So 
Do it again. I reckon the, uh, Laurence would be good at flesh. Yeah, who else is punching well? Joseph Blackmore's pretty good. Um, yeah, turns and Israel, he'll be trying to win that, and they need those points, or they need the big results. Uh, anyway, I, I didn't learn too much, Benji, apart from Ben Wells in really, really good shape with his kick, but we'll yeah. see how he goes uh, in Amstel. I think Liège is still a bridge too far for Benoit because the climbs go over two minutes. Uh, the women's <laughs> race in Brabant Chappelle, 135 kilometers, same finish in Alvarez up the S-Box, still with the Mosca Strat repetitions. Uh, I think they do four of them. Uh, and they start in St. Quintin's Lenick. And yeah. again, she is trolling me. I don't know if she was on the provisional. Maybe she was, but Elisa Longo Borghini, I swear I was, was just like, oh, she was? Okay. Yeah. She's because I picked her for Rubé and then she wasn't on the list. And yeah, then you've got Rubé PTSD. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Elisa Longo Borghini, she's, yeah. Uh, she was here. So it was her and Volering with the two uh, co favorites but again benji uh there's another breakaway uh that went decently far into the into the race yeah exactly emily watt chivalmer so chivalmer is their team corin labecki from ef got in Fist from life plus wahoo and laura molinar from volker vessels this was the earlier breakaway i would say from like a hundred ish case to go they went out but i'd say that the real action started trickling in in the last 40 kilometers we've got uh, just before the Esbocht Overreise, once again, one of the Esbochts, we've got two riders bridging towards the breakaway, Alessia Vigilia from FDG and Sofia Bertizolo from UAE ADQ. And then the next action happens on the Moscow Strat, 32 kilometers to go. We get to that that climb, the same climb where the men's were, were opening up, where the women's are now going to open up. And in the breakaway, Söder Fist is dropping, but in the peloton behind, which... The gap is still existing, but it's starting to become relatively bridgeable. So if someone goes on this Moscow Strat, it means that they'll be within reach of catching the breakaway fairly soon after. And that's exactly what triggers Little Trek to, to hammer it on this Moscow Strat. Little Trek does a lead out into it. He'll be tries to do a bit of an attack, some kind of like harder than hard pacing attack, if that makes sense. And Volring's in the wheel. Volring looks good in the wheel. It's still okay. And on those climbs, Volring halfway through, goes past the LB and keeps pushing towards the top, which then splits it. We've got two riders out the front, that is Volring and Elisa Longoborghini, and they're just uh, a two-women group going out the front of the peloton at this point. And over the top, the gap is not huge, but they keep on rolling together because they know, okay, we're both going to go ride. We're both going to gonna keep on riding here. We want to split, want to drop all the others, and, and they keep that going. Holst Head is the next climb. Volring and Longoborghini... Basically, catch and drop the Söderk Fist rider who was in the breakaway and then wasn't in the breakaway, and they both joined the breakaway. So Volring ELB joined the breakaway, and this brings us to, well, to be clear, the peloton is still within reach. We see Mavi Garcia just behind, facing the group, but then realizing there's an SD Works rider in her wheel. So then she's like, ah, I don't really want to close it for an SD Works rider in the wheel, and the gap stays existent until 22 kilometers to go. Is booked over Acer once again. And it's one of the coolest looking attacks ever. Because, like, Patrick, this is booked, by the way. I just think it looks very cool. They need the to do heli drone shot shots. Sick. Yeah. Heli shots, drone shots on the s booked because the peloton's not far behind. The following realizes that, gets to the front, starts motoring up this bloody climb, and just breaks this breakaway rider by rider. They, they, they start crumbling out of this group, and we, we get a situation where it's just following ELB and Alessia Vigilia, who who is half dropped, half holding on towards the top. And it was like, it was like a sprint from Volring in the saddle towards the top of this climb. And that's probably the best shot of this race. And ironically, that was the best shot. And at this point, I kind of gave up on the peloton because the gap was back to 20 seconds. Gigante is just pacing at the front of the group as hard as possible on these climbs. And she looks empty, but she kind of always looks empty when she's going full on hard. She gets no help from other teams. And I don't know what... What is your take when you're seeing these two riders at the front going into the head start with a 30 second gap while I'm trying to get my cable in because my laptop's going to die? Well, you've got the two strongest teams and the two best riders represented. So as you said, like the group behind is not coming back unless they can find a domestique that can pace as hard as ELB and Volring swapping off. And then what we saw last year in Liège, it's a very similar situation and it's so cool to have seen it now in in advance of that race but if you don't remember 
last year, there was Volering and Alisa Longo Borghini together. Uh, and I think Volering was the strongest. I don't, I can't remember. I think it was Rochelle Faucon where Volering went. And maybe yep. ELB was in her wheel. But in the end, she, ELB didn't have the, the legs to attack her, let alone out sprint her. And so it was actually ended up being a formality, kind of like the Strata finish. Yeah. Uh, and so I was keen to see, because ELB looks in unbelievable shape. Yeah. Like, she, I still think she could have won Roubaix. And how would she, would she do something different than what happened in Liège last year? Yeah, she probably would. And... The thing with Liège as well is that she might not have had it to, to really attack Volering anymore because Volering was on another level in the odd ends last year. But here we go towards the head start and gap was 25, 30 seconds. Volering hammering the tempo, ELB following. Vigilia, keep it up. Like she, she, was, she was holding the wheel behind again, Sara Gigante trying something, but UAE ADQ starts pacing them behind in the group and they're just neutralizing each other basically. But you said it, something was going to happen. We're looking at it. Moskestrad holds had a combination coming with 11k to go. Moskestrad, Demi Volring is hard pacing. Vigilia drops off the wheel. There's now two riders at the front. They're going to fight it out for the stage, for the race, for Kuhn, not for Kuhner, Brussel Kuhn. The fuck? <laughs> I'm at the wrong race. <laughs> wrong top <top-pro>. row. <laughs> ELB passes Volring, starts hard pacing. And at that point, when I saw ELB taking over from Volring and half wheeling her, I kind of had the vibe of, okay, ELB can win this, ELB can drop her, but it didn't happen on this climb. Volring stayed on the wheel, it was on the next climb, Holstheide, seven kilometers to go, that we do see a move. And Holstheide is not cobbled, so we've got this climb that is just happening, and Volring is pacing, and ELB just attacks from her wheel, and the separation was there initially already, Volring tries to close it, but just couldn't. As simple as that, and the gap just gradually keeps growing, and... I don't know, man, like, she just didn't have it to be the LB who was better today. As simple as that. Does that worry you for the upcoming two, three races for Volering? I mean, for Amstel, it's on Sunday, right? So, yeah. I mean, Volering did do a lot of work, it seems, beforehand, and she was really trying to make the race, so maybe it's good that she got a reality check here, that mm -hmm. you can't just hard pace with ELB on the wheel and think you're just going to win, like Liège last year. Maybe that's good. But in terms of improving your legs until Sunday and then flesh on Wednesday and then uh, flesh you still probably be the best, but then Liège on the next Sunday. As I said, Trek looked very, very good. I, I hope Van Anroy comes back in uh, because she, she was here and so she'll presumably be doing all those races. So it's a nasty team and she came fifth here as well, Van Anroy behind. So yeah, I think... Uh, I think Trek are the team to beat, honestly. Is Kopecky yeah. doing the Arden? Uh She's doing... She, she was set to be doing LBL. She was set to be doing Amstel. So I'm expecting her to beat her unless something happens between now and then. But I'm very curious how that combination is her. going to work out. Yes, but I'm also like, with Royster out, will Kopecky be co-leader? Probably. Yeah, I mean, you gotta, you got to bring her in because it looks like Volering, I know Fish, I don't know if Fisher Black will do EA. Yeah, she, she'll be a good added bonus, but... Yeah. And listen, Femke Heritzer was, was good too. She came fourth in this race. Uh, so yeah, did you say Elise Longborghini wins solo? Did you say the gap? What, sorry? No, I didn't. 41 seconds, so not a small gap at all. Uh, like, really, really yeah. was much more strong in the end. Manly third, won the bunch from behind for Liva Lilla, Jayco... 106 back, Femke Heretzer, who's on the SD Works team, who's quite young. Then Van Anroy, fifth, Amber Crack, sixth, Chiaboko, uh, seventh, Justine Hekira. Jeez, that's a tough one for me. Yara Kastelein, <laughs> and now an even tougher one. Margot van Pachtenbecher for Volker oh, Vessels. She did it. She was pretty good. You, you, met, you called her out yesterday, I think. Yeah, yeah. And the reason is that last year, she was in the group with Volering and Royakers in Brabant Sapel. When she wasn't riding for... Well, what was she riding for? I can't. I don't even. Park Hotel, Volker Park Hotel, yeah. So same team. Volker Wessels. Why is she is not Park on a world tour team? Uh, I mean, she, her results overall aren't aren't like yeah, but consistent sorry, there's, enough. There's also a lot of world tour riders. Yeah, fair. In women's yeah. world tour, who don't have regular top tens in yeah in these races. I don't I know, know man. Yeah. Pull some strings. Twenty-five. John Volker Vessels till twenty into twenty-five. It seems. But Volker Wrestle seems like a team that wants to 
wants to move up in some fashion, I would say. Because um, they took over Park Hotel Valkenburg to have that presence in the women's pel peloton. Um, I swear they're like a, a Conti. Yeah, I, 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 I swear they're like a Conti team that had like riders like Kun Vermelt for and so forth or something in the men's side. So they're kind of vibing in, in the men's side as well, but less known. But hey, I, I admire teams that step up on the women's side and also have ambitions there that might be bigger than their men's equivalent side. But anyway, like you said, ELB wins with 41 seconds, but I do feel like that doesn't represent the actual strength difference nah. between them. Yes, ELB was better, but as usual, in every single race that happens these days, the solo rider ahead tends to have a bit of a, a moto pacing gain, which was once again present here as well in this race. So uh, the 41 seconds won't define much, but she's better than Volering today. Did you... Did it change anything for you? You asked me that, Benji, but does it change anything for you for the upcoming Ardennes? Well, I thought Volering would clean the Ardennes, but I've... Uh, I don't feel that, that way now. She, she didn't clean the Ardennes because she lost today. <laughs> oh, this one, no, this one doesn't count to the triple, though. That's fleshly age Amstel. Yes, but this is the, this is the starter. And if the starter <laughs> does not sit well, I'm not happy with it. Yeah. So ELB looks very strong. It's going to be closer than I hoped for, which is good. Uh, she lost like this last races. year. She lost this last year, albeit in a sprint to Persico. Or a Persico? Really? I don't remember this race at all. And then what was the year she got nailed on the line by Ruth Winder? No, uh, it was Ruth Edwards. 2021? Yeah, Ruth Edwards beat her, nailed her in a sprint of a small group. I remember, yeah, 2021. Um, yeah, it's a name change, right? Ruth Winder to Ruth Edwards? Because I swear it was Ruth Winder back in the day. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was, I was feeling bad. I, I felt like I'd, um, I thought I got that <laughs> wrong, but. Okay, she's a name change. Fair enough. So, she yeah, was an American it, champion back then, I think, if I recall now correctly. Now, Ruth Edwards, uh, nay, Ruth Winder. Um, the. Yeah, I agree. Best you work's got to do something, Benji. Yeah. Which is good. They gotta do something. Uh, but I'm happy. I, I'm now more high for the other end. Uh, is there any other news around the right on the right, around the traps? There was the Giro d'Abruzzo, which is the Giro de Sicilia, uh, which couldn't yeah. go ahead this year, and so oh. they moved they moved it to the uh, the middle of Italy. On the topic of Giro d'Abruzzo and women's Brabant Sapel, can I tell mm. you the story about the coverage of the women's Brabant Sapel in Belgium? It's not on TV here. The rights are with Proximus, who posted on a live stream on the internet, and. No. I have like a is. paywall TV service and it's my, my dad opened the TV, tried to watch women's Brabham Sapel. It's not available. I've hated every single broadcast that was related to Proximus in the last four years. Schelde Prijs, Brabham Sapel, all those, all those women's side of the, of those races. Haven't they had some by, without comms? Uh, Proximus. Yes. Two, two years ago, they didn't have comms on these races. I don't remember if they had it last year or not, but, ah, oh, come on. And it's also... I feel like it's also the responsibility of Flanders Classics to make sure that their coverage of their women's races then gets distributed to, to areas. I think Proximus might be host broadcaster here, so maybe they just didn't find anyone to, to sell it to? Is, like, there has to be someone interested in that. No, like, Sportza must have been somewhat interested in women's Brabant Sapel. I don't see why not. It's pretty, it's got following it, and, like, it's got two of the biggest guns at it. I don't know. I don't but, know. Uh, I just, I just want better coverage of Brabant's Schelde Prijs, those women's races, on the in Belgium. Every other country is happy because it doesn't happen there. But here, the coverage was shit. Yeah, I didn't realize because <laughs> yeah, to me it, it it didn't make much of a difference. Uh, and but yeah, Giro Abruzzo was on TV instead. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, the style is not so good at Abruzzo, but uh, yeah, it's a far, it's a four day stage race that so they moved up from Sicilia. UAE come with uh, the strongest team by far with Sivakov, Adam Yates, but of course Yates is coming back from the concussion in the UAE, uh, as well as Jan Christen, who was very strong in Trofeo La Guelia. Yeah. Uh, Pozzo Vivo here, Tudor, uh, George Bennett for Israel, as well as, well as Rizzitello for GC, and uh, Lutschenko for Astana. I think he won GC at uh, this race when it was in Sicily, that is, uh, last year. And... Uh, Stage one was a sprint. I think, uh, what's his name? I shouldn't call him what I called him before. His name is Zanoncello. Enrico Zanoncello Mate. on Bardiani. 
<laughs> what? Why shouldn't you call him what you named him for? Huh? No, I actually called him Limoncello. <laughs> I, like... I opened my fucking DM yesterday and he said Limoncello on the stage. And I was like, who the fuck is Limoncello? <laughs> I also thought that as a hilly stage, he would beat Maluccelli, Penalva, Max Cantor fourth on Astana. That was a sprint. Uh, he's like a, he's, he's like a king high. He's like a, Zanoncello is the, um, Maresco Maresco. Ripoff. he's like me. Yeah. He's like Aldi Maresco. Um, Whoa. You're going he's like, far down if he's already Aldi Maresco. Well, yeah, he has like, he's only won one stage of king high. Like yeah. Maresco has won like 12. <laughs> and then today was sort of a, a medium hilly stage. Not that difficult, but it ended up being quite open. And uh, Jan Kristen, uh, UAE played their numbers in a reduced group, and he went solo, winning 16 seconds ahead of Lushenko and uh, Pesenti on JCL team Yukio, uh, continental team. So also finishing in that group was uh, Paul Double, Bennett, Sivakov, Pozzo, Voizard on Tudor, and Reichenbach, Reichenbach uh, and Adam Yates, the names you'd expect. Uh, and so young Christian, 19 years old, just took his first pro win. So we'll just, that's why I want to mention it. Just mark that down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, second at Milano Torino, fifth at Laguelia. He's clearly a super talent, uh, Christian. And he's going to do big things. And he signed until 2028, the end of 2028, for a reason. And he's just another one from the, uh, the UAE talent factory. So this race is being brought, is being brought up instead of Cecilia last year. But I feel like when looking at the style, is yes, is here with Adam Yates, but it's kind of he's only here because he's coming back from something. Is how yes. I perceive his present. Uh, uh, I'm Astana surprised here. Yeah. More guys aren't here for the Giro because actually they, you know, Prati de Tivo's in the Giro yeah. this year. Exactly. They do that tomorrow. Uh, I've got this vibe of like maybe it's a branding issue. <laughs> As in, I would rather do this than Tour of the Alps. Giro di Sicilia might have been more known in the past, and now Giro da Bruzzo is being brought in and doesn't have that name. And but this is a temporary replacement because a... Sicilia couldn't get the money to go, go forward this year. This is a last-minute oh, okay. race. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah. but I would rather do this than Sicilia. Like, it's in mainland Italy, easier to get to one, maybe. And then you have Prati di Tivo, 15k, 7% tomorrow, which is in yeah, the Giro. How many times can a human ride up Etna? Come on. Every many, year it's Etna. Yeah, many times. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the, the final stage on uh, Friday is a, is a hilly stage, which will kick off and UAE will win uh, that stage for sure. Young Kristen will probably win on Friday. Yeah. Uh, Yates, if he's in good shape, will win tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, that's all that's around the traps. Uh, there's no other news that I can, I can think of, Benji. Uh, and uh, we'll be back on Sunday, I think, for the Amstel Gold Race recap, the men yep. and women's race. So really looking forward to that. And I hope you enjoyed this Brabant's recap. We'll see you then. Ciao.